Still looking for a reliable source for your true crime needs? Meet True Crime Magazine, the world's leading publication devoted to true crime, serial killers, and criminal mind. True Crime Magazine publishes concise, exclusive articles based on original research presenting new discoveries and fresh interpretations by a team of expert authors such as Michael Butterfield, a recognized Zodiac Killer expert who served as a consultant for news articles, television documentaries, and director David Fincher's major motion picture, Zodiac. Or Dr. R.J. Parker, author of 25 true crime books, expert in serial murder and criminal profiling, and Dr. Bill Kimberlin, a professor of psychology, recognized death penalty, and death row expert. Exclusively for the And That's Why We Drink fans, they're hooking us up with an additional $10 discount off the original sale. Visit thecrimemag.com slash whywedrink to learn more about the offer. That's thecrimemag.com slash whywedrink. So, what's up? Not much. Well, you want to know something? Yeah. So, listen. Well, listen. My dad called. Hmm. I bet he did. <laughs> he had something to say. <laughs> he had something to say. Whatever you're about to tell me, every millennial's eyes are just rolling into the back of their head right now. Because <laughs> if you're <laughs> laughing at the fact that your dad said anything at all, it's going to be good. <laughs> He calls, I mean, ve- I mean, I'm not joking. Like this was very serious. Nothing about this was comical to him. It, uh-huh. was, it was an extreme problem. And he had to call me in the morning. Well, mm. it was very much early my morning because I'm P- Pacific Standard Time. It was like breakfast time, his time. And this is what the phone call consisted of. Christina, sometimes <laughs> I listen to your podcast at breakfast through my Sono speakers, which are like the the like surround sound through mm-hmm. his entire fucking house. Right. And I'm like, well, first of all, don't do that. Mistake one. Mistake number one. Don't. I was eating a muffin with orange marmalade. It was from Frida's bakery and my appetite was completely ruined. So I don't think people who want to enjoy their breakfast will be able to listen to the full episodes of your podcast. This is something you should consider. Our podcast is not called and that's why we eat. <laughs> so... There's that, Bernhard. I love when dads try to be constructive, but, like, at the same time, like, are the complete opposite. He's like, no one will want to listen. I'm like... He's like, okay, I'm sure one person will. No one will. No, nobody who wants to eat a marmalade muffin will want to listen to the podcast. Who also... Let's, let's not even get into it. Don't. Don't get into it. Um, my dad tried saying... Yeah. <laughs> my dad tried to give some constructive criticism as well. And by the way, this is a man who does not know what a podcast is. Um, I Oh, I also recently told him that they're the new version of radio, like there are generations radio. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I would, I would go so far as to say that most people our age listen to podcasts more than they listen to radio shows. I mean, it's, it's statistically I, accurate. I think the only like infamous radio shows to date still are like Howard Stern and like the fireside chats. Like... <laughs> Fireside. I was gonna say Ryan Seacrest, but I guess we'll go with Fireside. <laughs> I was trying to give history a chance. I like how you're trying to throw in your like elementary school history lesson. It's all I've got. Ugh. But so like my dad doesn't like. Oh, but I was gonna tell. I did tell him that like a lot of people our age will definitely listen to a podcast before a radio. And my father made this sound like he was throwing up. He was like, <laughs> I don't think so. Like he was trying to tell me, like, I don't know about my own generation. And he also, he doesn't have a credit card. He shares a cell phone with my stepmom. Like he knows nothing about technology. He literally spells YouTube with a U. <laughs> he doesn't know how, anything about this stuff. And Tell recent, them about the cloud. Recently, I tried to... Uh, I don't even remember what, how we led into this, but I was trying to tell him something really impressive about the podcast, and his response was, post that on the cloud. <laughs> and he was like, I don't know how, but if I could, I would. And I was like, well, if you find out, you tell me, because... <laughs> I didn't know we could post anything on clouds. Wow, um, if I knew how, I would post that on the cloud. And I was like, if you you figure it out, tell me. So I can do it too. That's my favorite thing in the whole world. Actually, he also recently just bought his own cell phone. So he no longer shares with my stepmom. That's amazing. Because he could not say, okay, Google to the phone anymore. Because I guess now, 
I'm not kidding you. That's the one reason he now has like a $240 bill every month. Because I guess like they, the new update, I don't have an Android, but that's an Android, right? Mm-hmm. But like apparently now it recognizes the voice of its owner. So only my stepmom can say, <laughs> okay, Google. But like if my dad says it, it doesn't recognize his voice. So it's it won't just open up. Siri, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. But so now my dad can't say, okay, Google, open <laughs> the map and directions to this place. And that frustrated him so much he bought a phone. Okay, Google, open the fireside chat. <laughs> I don't I don't know what's wrong with that man. Like I I didn't ask because it's too late, he's already paying for it. But I was like, why didn't you just open it up with a passcode or something and then just <laughs> go to maps? It's not hard. Insert your dad's vomit sound that he makes. <laughs> If he ever listens to this, let's hope let's hope this isn't the only one he ever listens to. It's just funny because my dad's the like I feel like our dads are the opposite in some ways because my dad's like extremely technologically savvy. Like he bu- like the second anything comes out, he buys like all the like he literally bought that like surround sound sono system where you're in any room of the house and you can like <laughs> change the music. And his favorite song is like that selfie song. Like, let me take a selfie. Me, like he, it's his favorite song and he thinks it's so funny. And so every time someone comes over, he like thinks it's funny to like play it in different rooms of the house. I don't know. Can't wait to meet him in October next year. <laughs> Get ready. That's probably what he's going to do at my fucking wedding. <laughs> so he plays our podcast on that Sonos thing. So it goes through every room of the house. And my stepmom's the opposite where she's like, she doesn't know how to like hit space on her phone so it's just like a bunch of letters in a row uh, <laughs> so i feel like our parents are just a wacky group my my mom the second anything comes out she buys it but it's only apple products she doesn't care for anything oh, else my dad refuses to buy apple he's like android technology you know well my mom got an apple iWatch or whatever <laughs> yeah. they're fucking called apple watch and as soon as she put it on for the first time and bragged to me about it and how cool it was, three minutes later in the other room, I hear her go, shit! And it had fallen and shattered all over the marble it tile. <gasps> yeah. And it like three minutes into her Linda. putting it on. She got another one. She's fine. Anyway. So. Um, that's how our parents are doing. So I know you guys wanted to hear about our parents. Because mm-hmm. that's all this podcast is about. Um, I also wanted to say another thing that I wrote down in a notebook that I didn't bring with me. So let's see. What was it? Hmm. That's Hmm. a fun game to play. Hmm. It's always fun when you think, oh, I'll be productive so I don't forget. And then you forget the productive aspect of it. You're like, great. I was productive. Let me put this away in a shelf. Like, Let me write a to-do list and then throw it away and try to remember (laughs) everything I wanted to say. And leave it at work so that tomorrow I can look at it and think, motherfucker, I didn't do any of these things. Um... We have a listener named Varak. Oh, shit. I'm spilling wine everywhere. Hold on. Oh, whoops. Is it good? Like, oh, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> if you think that's the first time I've spilled wine on this computer, look who brought his milkshake. <gasps> Baby G. Hi, honey. Sweet Babu. He's I so know, good. I know. It's so nice to you. Someone gave me that. He's like, now what do I get? He's, He's like, what? little brat. <laughs> what else? <laughs> uh, we have a listener named Varak, and he sent um, his company called D&K Monarchy, uh, sent... Uh, a few pairs of leggings for me to try because I nice. always talk about... And also, you're, I've never not seen you in leggings. Yeah, it's all I wear. So, perfect. Um, so, he sent that, and that was just really thoughtful of him. And um, the leggings are amazing. It's an L.A.-based company. Um, they're all different colors. There's different lengths. And um, he actually was kind enough to also offer 15% off uh, your entire order on their website, which is D as in dog, N as in Nancy, K monarchy.com and if you use the coupon code atwwd you get 15 percent off and i personally this isn't even through our network or anything i just want to you know it's just we're we're just plugging whatever we want today apparently well i was just very uh honored that he sent them and it's awesome i wore them and i was like these are really flipping great so he was like well if you want like your listeners can get a discount so i figured why not let everyone in on the secret why why not so why do you drink this week um, I'm mainly stressed because my whole world seems to be like at a, like a stress climax right now, because last week I tried really hard to be productive and somehow it backfired and I have more shit on my plate than usual. I think because I weeded out all the stuff I'm always actively avoiding, but mm-hmm. now that it's gone, I'm realizing all the other stuff that I've been really avoiding. And now I'm like, um, Oh shit. shit. Or, um, you know, uh, my roommates are currently both moving out 
So Woof. I'm very stressed out about having to find multiple roommates. I already found one um, who is our friend from our Boston program, other Christine, Christine, who we've mentioned on the show before. Christine number one. And we, I lived with her when we first moved out to LA. So Aww. it's like a reunion. And she's probably one of the best roommates I've ever had. So And I'm she's lucky like a real that. grown up with like a real job. And oh, she makes us look like we have no idea what we're doing. I mean, we, we don't. We don't. Also, RJ doesn't listen to this, so I can say it out loud, but I'm also planning a going away party for him. So, but it's a surprise. I'm sorry. I'm not attending because RJ doesn't listen to this podcast. I think if he does, we'll find out if he does or not based on how surprised he acts at the party. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, that's why I'm stressed. Also, side note, everyone, I've gotten like 300 messages about how to clean my sweatshirt. Oh, and I swear to fucking God, if one more person says... Tell Em how to clean her sweatshirt. I'm like, everyone has been very, very kind and very, very nice about it. And also, I've gotten a lot of um, kind words about me mentioning my depression last episode. Mm. A lot of people have been sending mm-hmm. in good wishes and saying, you know, I suffer from it too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I hear you guys. I'm sorry I didn't get to everyone. There's just only so many ways I can reply to 300 <laughs> pieces of advice about cleaning a sweatshirt. <laughs> and by the way, I tried everyone's stuff and there's still a giant did you, stain. Did you iron? Yes. Okay, I'll f- I'll tell you later. There's a way to get oil. I know what it is. It's oil. The, it's all gone. It's just the oil stain. Yeah, I know how to get it out. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Uh, I, Why do you drink? I drink because, like, speaking, <laughs> speaking of people, like, I feel like every time... Okay. I'm just going to say it. Tell me. <laughs> My anxiety is out of control. Christine and I are losing our fucking minds right now. All week... I don't know what's been going on, but to, like telepathy is a real thing, a especially real thing. when we are both so in sync with that kind of stuff and we're so close with each other that now I don't even have to text Christine. I can just kind of feel when she's probably going to reach out to me soon. And in the last couple of days, I have been at such a weird state of anxiety and it felt like it wasn't just my anxiety. <laughs> And then for some reason, I couldn't stop thinking about Christine. And I was like, this bitch is going fucking psychotic over there. I do a thing where I just spread my anxiety to other people. And so I, I, I tried calling you yesterday and you didn't answer the phone, but I was trying to call you to be like, what the fuck is going on? And then today I show up at our house and both of us are losing our minds. Geo, the therapy, emotional support animal does not know how to handle both guys, of us stressed out. I'm walks in and I'm listening to fucking Matchbox 20. That's how you know there's something wrong. The teen angst. Man. I swear to God, I... Why are you so stressed? I don't fucking know. I just have anxiety and it's so out of control. And I will say that my medication, I didn't... Walgreens fucked it up. So I wasn't on it for like three days. So I think that probably has (laughs) a slight thing to do with it. Even though Blaze likes to come for me by saying, no, no, no. It doesn't, like, that won't affect it. And I'm like, "Mm, mm." (laughs) okay, but placebo effect it does. (laughs) But also I had a dream that like eight people stabbed me. So I feel like maybe... I had a dream this week that Allison died and it was very bad. Yeah. So we're basically in a bad place uh, mentally, but you know, it's fine. And that's why we drink. It, that, I am very grateful for the podcast and for my job and for everything that's happening and for wine. Um, <laughs> I, well, I said I'm thankful that, for Allison and Gio and that's about it. And Gio. And Allison, I guess too. Um, but yeah, so that's why I drink. I'm just like really anxious to the point where I'm like digging my fingernails into my palms, but it's a know, good feeling. It's a good state we're in. It's like, it's like a learning stage. Um, anyway. (laughs) With all that, enjoy all of our stress, guys. I know you can feel it from wherever you are in the world. Do you guys like when you're our therapist? (laughs) Because that's what's happening. Because I like it. It's really... Christine, remember that time I was like, let's start a podcast so other people have to deal with our problems? (laughs) It's a good idea. Listen. You want to hear about someone else's issues? I only want to hear about someone else's issues. So uh, I'm trying to do a lot more stories where people request uh, the story because I want to do things that people care about. And that's why I did Crescent Hotel last week, which a lot of people wrote to me about. Um, You're really charitable, you know? Honestly, I'm I'm a saint. Yeah, I mean, you should be canonized. I mean, you are... We'll talk on, about it. You are on a candle with Gia. Oh, I love that. And you know what? That candle has not failed me or my sweatshirt. So that's right. Um, so I, this is, there's only one person who requested this story. However, they took my interest in ghosts and my interest in Canada <laughs> and put them together. Oh 
God. So thank you to Kate, oh, okay. whose handle is True North Ranger. Well, she sounds like a True North Ranger to me. And she suggested the story of Esther Cox and the Great Amherst Mystery. Which sounds like a wild ride. Sounds like the guy who wrote Polar Express decided... It sounds like a video game. It sounds like he decided to write a children's book about a a murder mystery. Well, here's the even more adventurous part of this story. My Mm. laptop is at 11% and my phone is at 3 So let's see how fast I can tell this story. Dun, dun, dun. So. Hurry up, Em. Here we go. (laughs) Um, All right. So the Amherst poltergeist case. Oh, no, 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 no. Is the most well-known documented poltergeist case in Canada. My homeland. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Also, a lot of people have been reaching out to me wondering why I love Canada so much. And listen, I don't know. It's just I know it in my soul, in my heart, and in my gut. And that's all that matters. All I have to say is a lot of people have been reaching out to me to ask why you love Canada so much. I'm just a true patriot. I'm like, if if M doesn't know, then how am I <laughs> supposed to fucking know? Look, all all we need to know is that America may or may not be the place I end up. I will say I some- mean, hell is where I will end up. But in between <laughs> there is like Canada. <laughs> you know? Canada's like purgatory. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if, if by purgatory you mean the greatest place on earth. Whether or not you've been there. Yeah. In 1878, in Amherst, Nova Scotia. Is that how they say it? Um, I like how you're like, I love Canada. And then you're like, every Canadian. <laughs> I mean, it just sounded more Midwest than anything It sounds to like me. Minnesota. Minnesota. Oh, and there go all of our Minnesota listeners. I just took a drink for them. <laughs> Goodbye. Um, in 1878, in Amherst, Nova Scotia, Esther Cox, who was 19 years old, was living with her sister, her brother-in-law, and about 7 million other people. Because in this house, there it was like a family of 10. Like, they were all kind of living in one small home. Mm. But they were all siblings or in-laws somehow. Okay. They also rented out the other room to passers-by. So they're just like 10 people, and then they're like, oh. Yeah, oh, they just all huddle together all the time. And then a rando just gets to come in. And then a demon. So. <laughs> oh, Okay. So one night, Esther and her sister, Jenny, um, are sleeping in bed, and they they shared a bed, by the way. Mm, Of course. And they feel something moving under the covers as they're about to go to sleep. All right, no. Um, Esther thought it was a mouse, and they both just went to bed, which, first of all, what what kind of bear grills (laughs) and who just feels a mouse in the bed and is like, oh, nighty night. Honey, don't... Sissy, don't worry. It's just a mouse. It's just... Go go back to sleep. It's just vermin. One time my aunt went into her bed in Germany. I promise this is worth it. She got into bed in their house and there was a bat hiding under the covers. Shut the fuck up. And she pulled up the covers and it flew out from under the covers. I swear to God, I would never, ever go to Germany again. And ever since then, she has to like pick up the covers and look. (sighs) I don't blame her. Can you imagine? Anyway. Oh my God. (laughs) Let's all take a sip for your hand. Cheers. Uh, So they thought a mouse was in the bed, and they ignored it. (laughs) Sorry. Already the uh, they're different people than I am. It was Stuart Little. Canada is a strong place. (laughs) Stuart Little. He was their little brother, (laughs) apparently. Um. So anyway, they ignored it, but they kept feeling something crawling in the sheets. And when they finally looked, finally they found nothing at all. Um, the next night, you know, because they went to bed and That's woke up. That's a relief. And, okay. The next night, um, they heard strange noises coming from under the bed, and they felt their bed moving like something was kind of kicking it from underneath. No, no. They looked under the bed. Poor choice again. <laughs> Don't. Why? Am I just from an area where I was raised? Like, I get I had a helicopter parent raising me, but also <laughs> never look under your fucking bed. I think as the 90s kids who watch, like, all real monsters and are you afraid of the dark and, and goosebumps and banicula we were like no you don't oh i love banicula me too but you don't fuck with that shit so anyway they looked under the bed they saw nothing there but a box full of fabric ew like fabric strips for sewing i guess okay and when they pulled it out the box flew in the air by itself <laughs> um and then because the true canadians they are got out of bed and walked over to it and then they were like, oh, sorry, box of fabric. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, sorry. 
And so then they touched the, they, they went over to the box and when they tried to pick it up, it flew away from them. <laughs> um, then they got scared, told their family, their family came upstairs and all of them witnessed the box fly to the other side of the room. All 10 of them. All 10,000 Canadians. 7,000 or whatever. Um, so anyway, the third night, because we're just on a roll. Sure, sure, sure. On the third night, uh, Esther went to bed early by herself. Don't do that. Again, stupid fucking choice. You gotta read a book or something. Are they even gonna talk about what they saw? Or they're just like, mm, that was weird. Are they gonna talk about it to who? To any? Are they gonna look at each other and be like, did you see that shit? Like, why is there a mouse in my bed? <laughs> why is there a box of fabric flying around? <laughs> So the third night, Esther goes to bed by herself early because she says she doesn't feel well. Jenny, her sister, then goes upstairs later that night after Esther has gone to bed, presumably. But then she opens the door. Esther jumps out of the bed and is screaming, what is happening to me? I'm dying. No. Jenny lights a lamp because... <laughs> it... <laughs> I thought you were going to say lights a cigarette. <laughs> Jenny's like, I'm too old for this bullshit. Jenny's like, oh, fuck. Jen. Jenny's like, I need a break. And that's why I smoke. <laughs> Jenny lights a lamp because there's no electricity yet in their home. Oh, sure. Okay. And after Esther says, I'm dying, what's happening to me? Uh, lights a lamp to see what's going on. And Esther's skin is bright red and oh. seems to be swelling unnaturally. Oh. She was hot to the touch. Her eyes were bulging out of her. Oh, and no. she looked like she was literally going to burst out of her own stretched skin. That's fucking disgusting. That is why Jenny lit the cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that episode where I talked about uh, Carl Tonsler and his like corpse uh -huh. that he brought home, and you were like, "Yeah, of course she smelled. <laughs> She's a fucking corpse." The bitchy seventh grader. The bitchy seventh. That's right. So obviously she smelled because like she was a dead fucking body. <laughs> God damn it, Megan. <laughs> I'm not saying she smelled. I'm just saying she was a dead corpse. So you do the fucking math. <laughs> So anyway, bullet number four. <laughs> Are we almost done? <laughs> okay. While... Oh, yeah. So anyway, she, her skin is stretched and all this nonsense. All right. So then she passes out from the pain. Jenny screams and the family comes upstairs, as they do, with the box and everything. All 7,000. <laughs> Just in an army line. <laughs> and um, they... They are all trying to wake her up, but instead she begins convulsing on the floor. And during this, four loud claps of thunder rattle around the entire house. Oh, And, no. like, everything in the house shakes, and they think it's an earthquake, but it's four bangs mm -hmm. hitting the house from all ends. Um, then Esther stopped shaking, her skin returned to its regular color, and the swelling stopped, as did the thunder. Four nights later, because we're just gonna skip through time one, and two... We're just going to ignore the last three nights and just continue on with our week. I feel like I'm watching, like, Big Brother or some reality series where it's, like, day one. I hope, like, at least the night after that, they were like, are you okay? Do you, like, need someone to go to bed with you? Like, what's going on? But they just, they just let her, whatever. Canadians were weird in the 1800s. They were just weirdly brave. So all these events kept repeating themselves after four days of rest. So oh. those those three days happened where they heard some, they felt something in the bed. Then they saw a box fly. Then she like almost exploded. <laughs> <laughs> and then four days of nothing. And then after that, the uh, same events began repeating themselves every night where she would like stretch out and. Um, it's like Veruca salt or whatever. Yeah, like she was turning into the blueberry girl, but like not in a chocolate factory, just. In, just in her, just in her weird squatting home, her overcrowded house. Um. So the family didn't know what to do, so they called the local doctor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And his name, I think, someone's gonna yell at me in Canada, but that's fine because you're Canadian. You can say whatever you want to me. Um. There, his name was Doctor Carrot or Doctor Carrot. I'm gonna go with Doctor <laughs> Carrot. <laughs> I'm not sure. Let me see. C A R R I T T E. C A R R I T T E. It means definitely not carrot. I mean, we're going to call him Dr. Carrot. I would say carite. Carite. Carit. Karate? Karate. Not karate. <laughs> Dr. It's, we've gone too far with it. We have to just keep calling him Dr. I would Carrot say now. Carit. Like karate. Is that what we're doing? Karate? I just want to call him Carrot. Okay, call him Carrot. 
Anyway, we'll just call him the doctor. We're going to get so many fucking emails. When don't we, Christine? Look, we thought only our moms would listen and we thought we'd get nothing but compliments. You say but- it to me, but I'm the one who has to respond like, I'm so sorry M pronounced that wrong. <laughs> Look, everyone, let's just all huddle together, hold hands across the universe and understand I'm never going to be 100% right. I'm <laughs> always going to... The number gonna- of emails I got about Menger Hotel where everyone was like... Why did M say Menger? I'm okay, like, for the people out there who are wondering why I said Menger, you all heard me for five minutes wonder if it was Menger or Menger. At least I was aware I, that I could be wrong. I said Menger, and then everyone was like, why? And I was like, am I supposed to say, oh. <laughs> here's, like, we can't please everyone, guys. Here's the philosophical reason why M said it a different right. way. Because I'm an idiot. That's why. If I you want to call me an idiot, you're not wrong. Go I for should it. just respond and say because we are idiots i give you permission if they're like it's not dr carrot be like well em's an asshole apparently i said glass glasgow 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 wrong and um there was a whole facebook thread about it because apparently i pronounced it like glass cow Mm -hmm. and a person who's from there said i butchered it and it's not i mean i guess it's just glasgow glasgow Glasgow. Whatever. Take anyone that's not in America to Massachusetts and have them spell any county. Worcester. Yeah. Spell yeah. Worcester Fucking right spell now. Worcester. It's not spelt the way you think it is. And also, although that is a British place, so never mind. <laughs> okay, but, everyone but England. And also, if I, you know, try try pronouncing Louisville. Try yeah. pronouncing it. If you want to fucking say something correctly, go record yourself. Right. Go, go record yourself. Go record yourself with your own sh- fucking noise. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if you don't like how we say things, just don't fucking listen to us. That was an out of body experience. <laughs> I was there for it. <laughs> you went out and I went in and we like ex- exchanged souls there. It was weird. Magic. Okay. Anyway, Dr. Carrot shows up. <laughs> Fuck you guys if you don't like Why the way I say it. Why don't you just call him Dr. C? You know what? Maybe Dr. Carrot can reach out to us and tell us he doesn't like how I say his fucking name. Oh, wait. It was in the 1800s. Dr. No, because then we're going to get fucking haunted. Do not do that shit. Do not tempt fucking ghosts to come haunt us. Also, before anyone else says anything, yes, we have been updated about Dear David, and it's terrifying, but we know what's going on, and it's equally scary for us. We're terrified. Anyway, fun fact, <laughs> David's last name is Carrot, so... <laughs> Dear David Carrot. <laughs> Dr. David Carrot. Dear Dr. David Carrot. You have to edit some of this out. <laughs> but why? <laughs> but I was drinking. <laughs> Doc- Dr. C. Why don't we call him Dr. C? <laughs> Doc. Okay. okay let's go. So the first night that he stayed over to examine Esther's behavior, um, he wrote down, because he decided he was going to keep a, like a, a journal mm-hmm. of everything that he witnessed the first thing he witnessed was she went to bed and he decided to stay like by her bedside and just see if anything happened while she was sleeping and he saw the pillow that she was sleeping on moving beneath her Mm -mm. without any hands pulling it from either side and her head stayed exactly the same and her hair wasn't touched so like it was just the pillow itself moving but no other part was being like affected by it. oh my god it was that rat probably oh yeah (laughs) right Exactly. As Stuart Little was back in the pillow. <laughs> so then, uh, other than the pillow, he also heard more thunder from beneath the bed only that he could not explain. And he also saw her clothes get thrown around the room by nobody. Just watching them just like fly up and then hit the ground and fly up and hit the ground. That was like the fabric box. Yeah. Yeah. Same ew. kind of thing. Um, so then one night after observing her a couple times, he started hearing a scratching noise That sounded like a metal tool scraping into, like, plaster or something kind of softer. Mm -hmm. And it was happening above her bed. And so he looked up and he saw letters etching themselves into her her wall. No. And eventually, when it was done, it spelt out, Esther Cox, you are mine to kill. What the actual fuck? Then a clump of plaster, after it was getting scratched out, a clump of plaster from the ceiling tore off the wall by itself and flew across the room, landing at his feet. Ah! So then, being the courageous Dr. Carrot that he is, (laughs) he returned the next day Uh and decided that he was going to keep observing. Okay. I guess because, like, he just didn't get, like, enough of a dramatic fix from that. But honestly, if I saw that shit in your house, I'd never come back. (laughs) 
just so we all are <laughs> Me clear. neither. I would go with you. <laughs> So he admitted to the family that whatever was going on with with Esther was something outside of his medical understanding. Okay. Good. Fair. That's, at least he's honest. I was going to say, I feel like most people would at least pretend like they knew it was a happening. good doctor. Um, he could only diagnose her with nervous excitement, although wouldn't anyone when, you know, you've got something like that going on? I'd be nervous Dude, too. I already have that. So he gave her a very, very powerful sedative. Oh, that's what I need to. But it was a powerful sedative in the 1800s. So either it was really good, like some Coke, or it was really bad. You know it was just like an illegal drug nowadays. Mm -hmm. It was like methamphetamine. And they're like, let's put it in your body. Just take all of it. So as soon as she took it, she fell asleep. And the noises around the house were louder than they they have ever been. Um, It sounded, apparently, according to his journal, sounded like a sledgehammer hitting the roof. And neighbors claimed that they could hear the sounds from down the street. Oh, geez. Um, And then manifestations slowly began to get worse over time. The first note I have, which makes no sense, but apparently is an important manifestation to mention. Okay. Potatoes hurled themselves across the room. (laughs) (laughs) Carrots and potatoes. I'm going to take a note now that I work at Nickelodeon because I feel like that's something I could work into an episode. Oh, yeah. Just potatoes just throwing themselves around. Just like lively potatoes. I wonder if it was just the potatoes. Like, why only those? Yeah, like, were there any were turnips? There, were there more? Did Was he just picky about what was going on in the vegetable bowl? It was just the root vegetables. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, those were just throwing themselves around. Right, sure. Um, also, spontaneous fires began erupting throughout the house. <laughs> Knives and forks suddenly flew across the room and would jam themselves into walls. Good, good. Uh, Furniture was being moved and tossed around when no one was actually in the room. People would just come in and see it just laying everywhere. Mm -hmm. Heavy drawers would slam up against the walls. Witnesses claimed to have heard the sound of a heavy slap, and then they would look at Esther's face and there'd be a giant welt showing up. Poor thing. That's like our early episode where someone got bitch slapped. Yep, paranormal bitch slaps. That's what she got. Pins and needles would materialize out of thin air and then fly into Esther's face. I'm sorry. That sounds like something, like, first of all, I'm not from Canada. You're not? Sadly. So I don't know if this is, like, an actual scary story that people think is real or if this is, like, an urban legend. But it sounds, like, with the pins and needles thing, that sounds like something your parents would tell you, like, like, don't cross your eyes or they'll get stuck that way. It's like... Don't do something or pins and needles just going to show up and slam into your face. I guess. It sounds like something really sick you would tell kids just to scare them. Yeah, but like what, like with what, like what behavior would cause that? Hmm. Like I got told if I pick my nose, my nose would turn giant like an elephant. Really? I never heard that one. That's because my families are crazy. I always thought it would be like, don't pick your nose or your finger will get stuck there. No, my family are crazy Germans and they're like, you will turn into an elephant man. And I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, also, a bucket of cold water on the kitchen table multiple times began boiling on its own. Why was there a bucket of cold water on the table? Why was it boiling on its own? Also, Esther claimed that the entity was threatening to burn the house down, and for some reason, through all of this, the family decided not to believe her. And (laughs) they were like, you're being dramatic. Like, pins are just showing up in your face, but no, the thing doesn't want to burn the place down. Stop putting needles in your own eyeballs. So they didn't believe her until not only were pins and needles materializing out of thin air, but so were lit matches, and they were dropping from the ceiling onto their home. No. All over the place. No. So, like, they were landing on people's beds, on the carpet. One of them landed in a bucket of cedar shavings and almost caught the entire basement on fire. Oh, my God. So, years later, um, Dr. Carrot would, uh, he wrote, (laughs) I know that's not his fucking name, guys. Um, He would be quoted later talking to a colleague saying... There was no fraud or deception in this case. Were I to publish the case in a medical journal, as you suggest, I doubt it would be believed by physicians. I am certain I could not have believed such apparent miracles had I not witnessed them. Whoa. So he's on board. Yeah. Um, also, this was around the time where people were really getting into like spirituality and thought they could connect with the dead and tarot cards and all that good stuff. And automatic writing was one of the big things. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, The family had psychics and automatic writers come through and they just to find out what was going on. 
And in one session, a spirit came through named Maggie Fisher, who apparently had attended the same school as Esther, but Esther didn't remember her. Um, other spirits were somehow related to the family. The main one to come forward, his name was Bob Nickel. And there's a lot of coincidences that kind of cast doubt about the validity of this. Okay. Because every name that she came up with sounded eerily like people that are act like that are actually in their real life that are still alive. Oh, so like nickel and carrot. <laughs> yeah, just inanimate objects. <laughs> um no, like one of the spirits so Bob Nickel um sounded a lot like some their family friend Bob McNeil. Um, um and a lot of people cuz later on I'll I'll describe it but um Bob McNeil actually was a guy it was a family friend that tried to sexually assault her. Oh my god. And so a lot of people a lot of skeptics have made the argument that these spirits were just projections of her emotional trauma. So I, like she yeah. said she was being haunted by someone that sounded a lot like Bob McNeil. I mean that's a fair point. Um for sure. So anyway, the violent demonic episodes continued for several weeks and feeling guilty, Esther decided to move out. Um, when feeling she, guilty because like her family had to deal with this. Oh my God. I know. Right. It's like, don't feel bad for us. Like you're the one that has a talk literally about, have this thing inside of you. Talk about Canadian man. Talk about Canadian man. <laughs> so while she was gone, um, there were no strange phenomena that happened in the house. So it was believed that like whatever was attached to her stayed with her when she moved out. Mm hmm. Um, after feeling that everything was okay in the house and back to normal, Esther returned back to be with her family, but then the activity came, started getting pretty wild again. By this time, she had received widespread coverage in local tabloids and regional newspapers, so she was well known oh. because, again, this was a time where people were really getting into spirituality, and she was the first case in their town mm. that someone might have a strong connection with spirits. Right. So everyone was really fascinated by her, especially an actor at the time named Walter Hubble. Uh-huh. Hubble? Hubel? Fuck. How Walter. Do you, how do you say it? Spell it. H-U-B-B-E-L-L. -L. Hubble. I would think Hubble. Definitely. Like the telescope. Definitely Hubble. We're going to call him Walter. All right. So anyway, he was an actor during the time, and he was so fascinated by this story that he decided that he wanted to take that room for rent in the house so he could live in the house with her and witness the shit happening. I think that's kind of fucked up. Like if I was being possessed and then like Ashton Kutcher showed up and was like, I'm definitely not going to help you. I just want front row tickets to this fucking show. I don't know how I'd feel. Oh, I'd be like, yes, please <laughs> take a seat. <laughs> like sit on down. I'll make the popcorn for you. <laughs> Ashton. <laughs> Me and Bob Nickel will make the popcorn. Dr. Carrot and I will <laughs> <laughs> give you a show. So, after convincing her that she should try to make some money off of her experience, her and Walter um, went on tour <laughs> to share her paranormal experiences. But after being heckled off stage for not being interesting enough because she couldn't do anything on command. Jesus. First of all, how in tune with spirituality are you if you're like do something and then nothing happens and you're mad wow. but so a lot of people were heckling them saying that just being lectured wasn't interesting enough mm -hmm. and one of the um groups of hecklers actually kind of turned into a pretty violent mob and so they got ran off the stage and that's when they gave up and went back home oh shit so she went home again <clears throat> so then esther wanted to try to make this stop so she tried going to church that's a good that's a good bet. Uh, yeah, I mean, it can't hurt, I guess. While sitting in church, she sat in the back of the pews and tried her best to just be quiet, but I guess that knocking and the thunder clapping that was going on under her bed seems to follow her wherever she stays for too long. So while she was sitting in the pews, all of a sudden all these knocks were happening around the entire church until Oof. the church until the I guess the knocking started next to her by the pew that she was sitting on and it spread out and eventually was only on the other side of the church. So it was muffling out what the priest was saying. Oh my God. And Ew. so feeling bad, she just like up and left in the middle of the sermon. Esther just can't get a win. She can't get a win. One night she fell into a trance um, during, I guess, another psychic came and tried to like hypnotize her or 
talk to something through her. She went to a trance and finally came out about the story with Bob McNeil and how he asked her to go on a buggy ride, romantic. Mm -hmm. And while out, he pulled over to the side and by gunpoint tried to force her into the woods with him. But another couple heard the commotion, so they he got back into the buggy and drove her home. I'm going to kill him. Yep. And so anyway, she apparently had no recollection of it until it like came out. Mm-hmm. Like she had repressed it. Um, mm-hmm. And that was when people were like, wait, didn't you say that the thing that was following you around's name was Bob? Who yeah. happens to be the same age and had the same occupation as this guy that assaulted you? Poor thing. So a lot of skeptics use that as the... Okay, well, maybe this wasn't a ghost. Maybe this was just her freaking out. But then how do you explain shit catching on fire and cold water boiling on tables? Maybe it was a combination of she was so traumatized and the negativity. The energy. combined, The energy up. combined with, I don't know. It's a good point. That's just always how I look at things. But it's That's uh, how I would too. That's why we have this podcast. That's why we're probably and wrong. And that's why we drink. And that's why I drink. So anyway, and so... She was still staying at the house. She has now come to terms or is coming to terms with some past trauma. And she was like, okay, well, maybe like things will calm down now that I'm giving more answers about myself. A neighbor um, stops by to hang out and he's playing with a pocket knife that he brought with him. Casual. And it suddenly rips out of his hands and flies straight into Esther's back. Um, Like deep into her back. And that was... Everyone watched it just fly out of his hands. Not in, like, a he threw it way, but, like, just flew out, like. Listen. Like some hocus pocus stuff. Don't play with a fucking knife around Esther. <laughs> I'm saying. And so that was her last draw, and she was like, fuck it, I'm leaving, I'm moving out. There's a knife in my back, I'm leaving. Especially because the landlord wanted to evict the family because of all the shit that was going on, <laughs> but they didn't have, like, any real they were, like, proof. The whole house is catching on fire <laughs> all the time. It's like, we're not trying to be dick landlords, but also stop it. But, like, matches are falling from the ceiling. <laughs> so, <laughs> taking responsibility, she moved to a nearby farm. Oh, God, Esther, I'm so sorry. But then the farm's barn, within a month of her living there, burnt down to the ground while she was sleeping in it. Sure it did. And the farmer arrested her for arson. I'm sorry. She was sleeping inside the barn. She was living on someone else's farm, living in the barn. And did she... And then a month later, it's it's caught on fire while she was in it. So the farmer thought that she was an arsonist and lit his own barn on fire and called the cops. she obviously survived, but she was arrested. She survived and was arrested, and she was convicted for four months. Mm -hmm. But because she was known around town for this story, and there was a lot of public sympathy... The town demanded that she get taken out of jail early, and so she only served 30 days. Can you imagine, one, having a town that supportive of, like, (laughs) oh, you poor thing, you were just haunted, let's get you out of jail. Oh my god, it was definitely the ghost that set your barn on fire. The world would be a very different place if we all just helped each other out when it came to ghosts. Or if everyone just assumed that crimes were made by ghosts. Right. (laughs) So anyway, she only served 30 days, and after she was freed from jail, the poltergeist activity just totally went away. What? No one knows what happened, or if, if it wasn't real, if she just, like, gave up on that whole act or maybe it got tired and bored of her and it went away on its own no one really knows the only epilogue to the story is that she later in life esther got married twice and died in 1912 at age 53 that's that oh that's the epilogue that's the epilogue um walter the actor that went on a fake tour with her oh sure walter he published a book about his experiences in there. And he was also writing everything down, just like the doctor. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a book called, um, well, he wrote the same book twice. He has two different editions of it. Um, But the first edition was written in 1879. It's called The Haunted House, A True Ghost Story. And it includes an affidavit signed by 16 witnesses who swear that they saw all of this stuff. Like an official, like, they're swearing that this happened. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and then the second edition, which was in 1888, is called The Great Amherst Mystery, A True Narrative of the Supernatural. Oh, he just, like, amped that title up. Well, so that's the thing. A lot of people, it's like, which book do you believe? Because apparently in the first book, he was much more dramatic and, 
um, very descriptive, but like very flowery descriptive. Mm-hmm. So, but then in the second one, he like tried to be really clinical about it. So like basically because his account of it within 10 years of each other is so different, the perception of like your perception of the story like really matters based on which version of the book you believe right, in. Right, 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 right. Like in, uh, in the first one, he was like kind of a dick about Esther. Like he described the sister as like really beautiful and thin and Ew. fair. And then with Esther, it was like, she's a queer girl. Like, it's like, I'm sorry. Kind of just like, kind of like, it was like, she's lazy and sulking in. She's a queer girl with like pins and needles in her face. Yeah, like she's had enough. There's like a knife in her back and there's pins in her face. Like she's not really that pretty. Well, also he went from the first book where he was saying that devils were possessing her mm-hmm. to in the second book saying that there was just an evil ghost in the house. Mm. And like base no matter what in both books he says that there was no trickery, like this was all absolutely supernatural, but depending on which book you believe in shows like like how how much drama you're really falling for, you Walter. Know? Walter you you made your money. Yeah. Congratulations. Like, just... And that's why he drinks. Just relax, Walter. Tell me a tale. Tell me a tall tale. Do you maybe want to hear about a guy named Herb? Well, depending on if you are um, from America or the UK, wouldn't it be Herb? No, Herb is the... Uh, the, the food. The food. The All right. Herb for like Herbert. Yes. Okay. Herb. Like Herbie fully loaded. Yes. I got you. Now we've got the American slash Canadian on board. <laughs> I'm blushing. Let, let's talk about Herb. Let's talk about Herb. Baby. But let's talk about you and, and me. me. Let's talk about Herb Baumeister. <laughs> uh, German names just never work in those kind of you songs. You really love the German names. R&B and German names don't go together. <laughs> Herb Baumeister. You want to know about him? All right. All right. Lay it on thick. He was born in Indianapolis, Indiana in 1947 and was the oldest of four kids. Uh, his childhood was reportedly pretty normal until he was a teenager. Mm. Then he started showing antisocial behavior, such as... Oh, no. What's one thing that you think maybe he did as a fucking antisocial potential murderer? Um, I'm going to go with wanting to hurt people. Do you just want to hurt people? Animals. Animals? That's Close very... Enough. That's sociopathy, though. Yeah. Whatever. It's also very antisocial. I mean, he wants to kill things and get them out of his way. Yes. Let's call it that. All right. So he started... I just wanted to go with the broad umbrella term so I wouldn't be wrong. I mean... It's usually... That's how I got through high school, so... I consider Gio a people, so... Oh, maybe G's so sweet. (laughs) He's such a good boy. So he started showing antisocial behavior such as playing with dead animals and urinating on his teacher's desk. Mm, I did that. (laughs) No, I didn't. I paused for a moment. I watched you wonder. It kind of hurt. I didn't want to judge. Okay, I feel better. One of his childhood friends later reported that Herb would fall into, like, these strange reveries where he would ponder, like, horrific things. One of them was like, I wonder what it would taste like to drink human urine. Like, he would just come up with these, like, crazy hypotheses or, like, these crazy thoughts and have these reveries and tell his friends about them. Um, one morning on the way to school, he picked up a dead crow, put it in his pocket, and when he got to school, he put it on his teacher's desk. I mean, obviously he hated that teacher. You know, I, I did wonder if it was the same teacher. Because it's like giving an apple to a teacher that you like, you just give a dead crow to one you don't like. Yeah, my English... Like, oh, it's finals week, here's a dead fucking crow, professor. My English teacher, um, someone put a dead bird in his drawer. <gasps> oh my. And was his... that... Was it Herb Baumeister? <laughs> and it said, you're dead, but it was spelled Y-O-U-R. So he was Ugh. like, isn't that hilarious? And we were like, no, someone put a dead bird in your desk. With a death threat. Yeah. And it wasn't even grammatically correct. <laughs> That's such an extra fuck you. If someone's going to write me a death note, at least you're like dead. be right about it. <laughs> no. He thought it was so funny. We were like, we need extra security. <laughs> um, anyway. 
So, okay. He basically put a dead bird in his teacher's desk, blah, blah, blah. Um, his dad was like, oh my God, something's wrong with him. So he was diagnosed with schizophrenia, but did not receive any psychiatric treatment. So his dad was like, here, go to this hospital. And they were like, he has schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of, and then they were like, oh, well we have our answer. Let's do nothing about it. They're like, good. Here's another crow. Uh, Um, okay. So he attended a couple semesters at different colleges, but would drop out and then like go back a little bit then drop out. Um, he also drifted through a variety of jobs. Apparently he had a strong work ethic, so he would like, he was able to keep jobs for a long time, but his behavior was becoming increasingly bizarre. Um, so here's an example. His dad was a respectable member of the community and was able to get Herb a job as a copy boy at the Indianapolis Star, which was like the local newspaper. Um, an advertising executive named Gary Donna said he remembered one incident where Herb offered to drive Gary and his friends to the Indiana University football game. Mm-hmm. And when they agreed and they were going to bring their significant, like their fian- uh, you know, wives or girlfriends or whatever, they all met up to get picked up. And, um, uh, uh, Herb- and then a door creaked. <laughs> I forgot his name. Herb. It's just such a weird fucking name. Yeah. And then Herb showed up in a hearse. Nobody right. nobody knows where he got it. Uh, he just showed up in a hearse. Um, he was wearing a chauffeur's cap and he raced to the game with the lights on and like put, made traffic pull aside and uh, all the people were like, who is this weirdo? And that was it. That's- you know, speaking of Canada, um... <laughs> You know I love a good episode of Degrassi. Mm, and, don't, don't we all? And there was one... There was a few seasons. Like, he became a, a regular mm-hmm. eventually over time on the show. But his name was Eli, and he drove a hearse. Mm. I always remembered that. So now, for the rest of this story, I'm going to envision that character. Please don't, because it will ruin him for you forever. I never liked him anyway. Oh, good. Okay, then. Keep it up. Here we go. So... Basically, he started working at the DMV, and he would rant and rave at people, which apparently was, like, a weird thing, but I'm like, people at the DMV have ranted and raved at me for many years, so I don't think it's that unreasonable. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't, don't, we don't even have to talk about the DMV. Every single person hurts when they think about it. Okay, good. I'm just glad. I'm I'm like, I don't understand why. We could do an episode... Of, and that's why we drink at a DMV, and people will really feel our pain. It should be the next Halloween horror episode. Oh, perfect. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, also while he worked at the DMV, he sent his coworkers a Christmas card with a photo of him and a strange man, both dressed in drag. Why? Yeah. Not, why? Fuck! Give me a card like that. Everyone was like, "Okay." Like no one knew. I feel like in LA though, that's a pretty common holiday card to get. Oh yeah. In L.A. in 2017, maybe. Yeah. But not, uh, right. you yeah, know, right. not at the DMV in, you know, the fucking 70s or 80s. So, da, da, da. The DMV thought he had potential, so they made him program director. <laughs> if only jobs came that easy. <laughs> Let me just show you a holiday <laughs> card of me and drag. Oh, I'm promoted. I know. I'm like, oh, that's all it takes? Um... <laughs> I'll go to Vista Print and get some really raunchy photos, <laughs> and you can give me a raise. So, hello, Nickelodeon. Have you ever heard of Drag Race? Hello. Here hello. I am. Anyway. I wanted to see how long that pause lasted. I wanted to make it longer, but I also just... I want to knock it out of the park. I like to just keep talking. Um, so, instead of toning his antics down, uh, the, he essentially just kept going haywire uh he peed on his boss's desk at one point Hmm. i've done that which also is something if you remember that robert durst did Mm -hmm. yeah that was like number three it was very early on but anyway yeah robert durst also pissed on his boss's desk which right on i feel like maybe that's like a it's like a territorial yeah dominance thing yeah exactly um but he wasn't fired for it why not? Um, I, he, listen, again, I don't fucking know. Uh, he didn't actually get fired until he urinated on... Do you want to get... I feel like a I... A dead crow! 
<laughs> I feel like I always make you guess, and I'm like, I don't know why I do that, but I, it's like fun. You hate when I make you guess. No, I love guessing. You're just always wrong. Well, you're always wrong too. Oh yeah, that's, that's the true. fun of it. No, you hate the numbers game, and I'm like, guess how much? And you're like, oh brother, because I'm always going to be a thousand well, off. I hate the numbers game because you know I hate numbers and math. What did he pee on? Numbers? He peed on negative eight. No, I'm <laughs> He peed on a letter addressed to the governor of Indiana. Ooh. You don't do that to the governor of Indiana. Why would, like, you're obviously doing that on purpose. Like, there's letters to all sorts of people. And then you take the the letter to the governor of Indiana. Who's writing the letter? I don't know. Also, like, I don't know what's going on in the 70s when it comes to the thinness of paper. But, Mm. like, if you're peeing on that, is it just dissolving in your own hands? Like, is there even a letter to read later? Yeah, you're peeing all over yourself, too. Mm Mm-hmm. So, basically, this entire DMV smelled like piss. There it is. That's really the moral of the story. Anyway. He married a woman named Julie. There. Okay. Most normal thing you've said tonight. (sighs) Just gotta ground us in reality, you know? He married a woman named Julie Sater in November 1971, and the two had three kids. Around this time, he and his wife founded the Save-A-Lot thrift store chain, not to be confused with the Save-A-Lot grocery store chain, Mm. which I did confuse them. I see why you would have done that. Yes. And the Save-A-Lot thrift store chain was actually extremely successful. So he became, he and his wife, Julie, became um, pretty affluent, pretty, like, well-respected members of their community. But again... They only had two locations. It was not the Save-A-Lot grocery store, which I believe still exists to this day. Not the same. Anyway, um, so he and his wife had enough money at this point to move to a more affluent part of Indiana. So they moved to the Westfield District, which was about 20 miles out of Indianapolis. They bought a home called Fox Hollow Farms, Hmm. which sounds like the most, like, bougie Indiana (laughs) house of all time. Um, And it had four bedrooms, an indoor swimming pool, and a riding stable. Hmm. Uh, It was 18 and a half acres. One less than mine. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay. You're Pasadena. I'm just saying they think they're better than me, but let's be real. I have two indoor pools. It's like... Just pour your wine. It's like, just because your 18 acres smell like chlorine. (laughs) We know if you had a pool, it would have... It would just be Shiraz, and you just dive in. And I wouldn't be indoor. It's like, I want to get some sun while I'm in there, you know? (laughs) No, but that would heat it up faster. What would? It would be warm Shiraz. Wait, I don't want Shiraz. Oh. No, no, no. Listen. You could do it in white wine. You could have a pool of white wine, and that way, would, if you peed in it, no one would know. No, it's got... Yeah, well, that's a good point. I gotta write that down. <laughs> okay, so a Chard- Chardonnay pool. Mm-hmm. At least make it like a... Like okay. a... Like a... Like a... A white... A white wine kitty pool, because you know that's where the pee's going. That is. But here's the problem. The Chardonnay, or the white wine, is supposed to stay cold. Mm. And the red wine is supposed to stay not as cold. So it's like, which one do you put where, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I see. Well, then you could do a, a, a Shiraz jacuzzi. Yeah, Shiraz jacuzzi and like a Chardonnay lap pool. Okay. Okay? That's where we are. All right, good. Write that down. I mean, mine's going to be the coldest of all because it's fucking ice cream. <laughs> yours is just like people will like get like weirdly like do that tiptoe dance walk without the towel into <laughs> your like Shiraz jacuzzi and they'll look like warm up oh that's so fun though oh interesting oh good times we'll put it on our vision board <laughs> wait wait can we can we actually do yeah it? like I'm not fucking around yeah okay all right so anyway Their marriage sucked. Mm. Sorry, everybody. Herb called the shots in pretty much everything. Um, They actually had these brief periods where they would split up and then get back together. It was just a big mess. Um, Julie later admitted that she and Herb had engaged in sex. So they were married 25 years. 
Mm -hmm. Guess how many times they had sex? Zero. Well, that's fucking stupid. They have three kids. Three. No. Okay. You know what? You failed this game. You don't like the numbers game either. I don't like them. This how many is, times did they have sex? This is why I don't like the numbers game, because it ruins the game. Okay, how many times did they have sex? Six. Oh. Okay. Okay. Six times in 25 years. So a failed and successful attempt for each kid. Yeah. Got it. So they were 50% success rate. There it is. Yeah. Not many married couples can say that. But, I mean, you know. So they had six sex six times in their 25 years. Yowza. Time to sleep. Fuck you, Fitbit. Uh, <laughs> my Fitbit just said time to sleep. That's like when my phone says, it doesn't tell you that you've used up all your data. It just says, you can change your data services on settings. And it's like, oh, can I? Thanks, mm. mom. What the fuck? Mine doesn't say that. Mine says you used up all your fucking data. Oh, my phone's just way passive aggressive. Oh my God. Mine's just fucking aggressive. Anyway. So anyway, Herb and his wife never had sex they just like didn't have sex um and then there was this guy who did have sex with herb's wife no okay there's this guy Mm -hmm. okay hold on i just fucked this up nice you're welcome so according to julie she never saw her husband nude so he's like a never nude like like tobias fionke <laughs> Wonderful. I just blew myself. Oh, it was so good. You guys. If you don't watch Arrested Development, please go do you it. You gotta do it. Okay. So basically, she said she never saw her husband nude. Apparently, he would like change in the bathroom, and then when he would come to bed, he would put his pajamas on, or he would like go between the sheets because he was too ashamed of his skinny body. Hmm. So. You know how skinny you gotta be to be ashamed. Who knows? All right. So anyway, one day in 1994, their son Eric was playing in the woods outside when he found a complete human skeleton. Just one whole complete one, and enti- nothing missing. The whole en- deck, an entire skeleton. The whole deck. It was partially buried, and he showed his mother, who waited until her husband got home to ask, um, "Hi, where did the skeleton come from?" You know, as you do. Right. So Herb got home, and when he saw the skeleton, he was like, oh, it was my father's, it was one of my father's dissecting skeletons, because his father was an anesthesiologist. So he's like, oh, it was one of my dad's, like, um... Was just hanging out in the woods, or what? So he said it was one of his, like, uh, you know, dissecting skeletons, and it had been stored in the garage, and then Herb was like, I gotta clean the garage out, and he Um, decided he was just gonna bury the skeleton in the backyard. Right, yeah. You know, like as if he were to cover something up, but he's not. Isn't that funny? Ha ha ha. <laughs> it's like, I'm just going to like bury like, you know, some like power tools and a John Deere and a full body skeleton yep. in the backyard. <laughs> like when you clean out the fucking garage. Yeah. So she was like, okay. <laughs> Sounds a lot like Esther Cox's family. Just being like, whatever. I mean, she did have a lot of needles directly in her face. Right in her face. That's weird. Um... This is where our friend comes in. I'll tell you what. Mm-hmm. His name's Virgil Vandegriff. Of course it is. Uh, yeah. Or should I say Virgil Vandegriff, P.I. Hmm. My favorite. Right? Oh, yeah. Let's write a show about that guy. Tell me. <laughs> where were you on the night of <laughs> yesteryear? Where were you on the night of yesteryear? The day of your <laughs> two fortnights from the day of your and yesteryear. A score. A Where sc- were you a score ago? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's idiotic. A okay. score in a yore. Where were you a score in a yore ago? I tell you what, that sounds like a band name. A score of the score of your, and it sounds like a, it sounds like a band that's like. Like an Irish, like, uh, folk It sounds like band. Flogging Molly. Yes. <laughs> the score of your. And literally. And they're like, oh, we're so badass. And it's like, I mean, you're good for like, for like a festival, but that's it. Looks like we found the title of this episode. What is it again? The score of your. Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> write that down. I will. I do this thing where I tell myself to write things down 
out loud through the podcast so that you'll listen to it later but always like i do it all the time like yesterday i was in the car and i went write that down but i was telling myself <laughs> but i was driving my car so i was like well no one's gonna but i tell me it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't make sense it's fine <laughs> just write that down all right so anyway Vandegrift uh, had a private investigation firm in Indianapolis, and he specialized in missing persons cases. A woman came to him and said her 28-year-old son, Alan Broussard, had gone missing. Vandegrift assumed that uh, Alan Broussard was just a runaway because a lot of times, you know, he would get cases where people would come and say, oh, my, you know, someone's missing. A lot of times it turns out to be a runaway or a miscommunication, so on and so forth. Mm Mm-hmm. So uh, he did a little research. He found out that Alan Broussard, um, who, the guy who had gone missing, was a heavy drinker. He was gay. Um, and again, this was in a Bible Belt town. It was in, you know, Indiana. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was last seen leaving a gay bar named Brothers. So he kind of like kept that information. And then pretty soon after that, he found out that an Indianapolis police detective named Mary Wilson was working on the cases of other gay men who had disappeared in the area. And he noticed parallels between them, including their ages, obviously their sexual orientation, and their physical appearance. So he was like, "Mm, it's a little fishy. (laughs) Then he saw a small article in a gay lifestyle magazine called The Indiana Word about a man named Jeff Jones who had disappeared the year before, um, who had essentially just vanished. He was like, these are really similar to the other men who have gone missing. So at this point, he knew something was up, but it wasn't until another man, 34-year-old Roger Allen Goodlett, mm-hmm. vanished after visiting a gay bar that he suspected a serial killer. Oh, my. So when Roger disappeared, he was like, okay, something's up. This is not normal for, like, a small Indiana town. You know, it's, right, it's right. just not normal. Um, so the police seemed disinterested in his findings. Surprise, surprise. But he decided to investigate anyway as a private investigator. A few weeks later, a man named Tony Harris, which, by the way, is a fake name because he did not want to be named okay, for fear of his life. Okay. Who knew Roger Goodlett, the last man to go missing. Oh, no. From the gay bar scene, approached uh, Vandegrift with some new information. So he told him that the police had ignored his story and thought he was crazy. He told the FBI, who thought he was on drugs. Mm-hmm. And then he called Roger's mother, so his friend's mother. And his Roger's mother put him in touch with Vandegrift, the private investigator. Okay. So he said to Vandegrift that his story sounds crazy, but it's 100% true. And he said, I met a man, and I know he was a serial killer. Oh, crazy. So... Tony was terrified for his life telling the story, um, but over the course of a few weeks, he kind of, like, gained, or they kind of gained his trust, and he was able to reveal pretty much the whole story. Let me tell you Tony's fucking story. Tell me Tony's fucking story. It's bananas. I want to know. It's bananas. We all want to know. All right. Take a drink, y'all. Tony was at a local gay bar in town called the 501 Club when he noticed a tall, lanky man. Tony took note of him because of the way he was scrutinizing and staring at the missing persons poster behind the bar. The poster was a picture of Roger Goodlett, who was Tony's friend, Mm -hmm. who had gone missing. And Tony said he could simply tell by the way that this guy was captivated by the poster and staring at it that he had something to do with his friend's disappearance. So he did something questionable. What? He went up and introduced himself. The man introduced himself as Brian Smart and said he knew nothing about Roger, because Tony asked. Mm -hmm. He did, however, invite Tony out for the night, and Tony uh, agreed. So Brian Smart said he was a landscape artist from Ohio, currently living in an empty house outside town, and that he was landscaping the property for its new owners who were going to be coming soon, but who weren't living there yet. Mm -hmm. So he invited Tony to his empty house for a cocktail and a swim. Oh, my. Red flag number one. So this is where shit gets weird. Brian drives Tony out into the suburbs in his Buick, 
uh, they arrive in a neighborhood of large houses and horse stables. They arrive at a dark, unlit mansion, enter through a side entrance. Tony follows Brian through a number of rooms, then down into the basement, where they arrive at an indoor pool. Hmm. Of Shiraz. <laughs> no, that's the jacuzzi. Right, 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 right. Right, right. Sorry, the rosé. It Actually, rosé would be a good fit for an indoor pool. Mm-hmm. The outdoor pool. All right, we'll talk about this later. So they arrive in an indoor pool, and in the darkness, Tony sees a number of mannequins staged in various poses around the pool. And then Tony got the fuck out. Oh, no. Tony's an idiot. Tony had quite a night. Brian explained, I get lonely down here. They give me company. The second you meet someone who says that, you turn around. The second you see a mannequin, you turn your body the other way, and you go as far in that direction. <laughs> the second you meet someone who isn't also creeped out by mannequins, just just go. You might die <laughs> really, really, really soon. <laughs> Like, if you see a mannequin, I don't care if you're in Nordstrom or, like, where you are, but just... Like, I know I'm going against my own people here, but mannequins and clowns, I swear to God, if someone is like, look at all of my clown dolls, they keep me company. It's like, mm-hmm, well, I'm certainly not gonna. Bye! It's like, <laughs> it's like, you should go drown in a pool of Shiraz. What? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what else to say. I'm just really worked up about this. Tony? The fucking pool is surrounded by mannequins. Let's just remember. Wait, what? The whole pool? Yes. Oh, I thought we were in a little shed next to the pool. I didn't uh, know no, we were. No, my friend. I just said. I think you did, and I just ignored it. I, I know. I didn't want it in my head. In the darkness, Tony sees a number of mannequins staged in various poses around the indoor pool. Yeah, never mind. Okay, so. You, you know, like, you were right. You, you just forced the knowledge into me. Yeah, okay. I didn't want it. But here we are. That's what I do. Um, so he's surrounded by mannequins, right? Okay. So uh, Brian's like, hey, do you want a drink? And Tony's like, no, thank you. Good boy. But then he notices uh, that Brian kind of darkens at this uh, rejection, right? Ooh. Um, but then Brian's like, it's time to party. But then excuses himself briefly. And when he gets back, he apparently has a completely different attitude, was looser, was chattier, and Tony later said he believed he had gone back and taken drugs, mm -hmm. probably coke. So Brian then convinces Tony to go for a swim, and Tony obliges. So Tony gets into the pool naked. Uh, the two of them chat about a number of topics, and then all of a sudden Brian's expression changes, and he says... I just learned this really neat trick. Okay. Let's just remember that they're surrounded by fucking I mannequins. haven't forgotten. Let's just remember. Um, he picks up a hose and says, if you choke someone while you're having sex, it feels really great. You get a great rush. He explains which two veins you have to pinch to get the right buzz and says you can tell it's working when you see the person's lips change color. Fuck that. So Tony is like, just like, I don't know, in the pool, like doggy paddling at this point. <laughs> Real sexy. He's also, in case we, any of us thought, oh, maybe, you know, if they're in the pool having a good time chatting and you think like, <laughs> oh, this could be romantic. Remember that what they're looking at. Like you could think that this guy maybe isn't crazy and then look over his shoulder and see five mannequins watching you get choked out as you doggy paddle and they're posed mannequins gnarly and this guy's holding a hose talking about pinching your... no yep. thanks yep 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 so so i guess they try it so he's like so tony's in the pool he's listening to brian explain like which nerves to whatever which veins to press then he says he is suddenly convinced that Brian is the one who killed his friend Roger. Good boy. Get out. So Brian goes, do it to me. Oh. That's... And lays down on a couch in the corner of the room. So Tony puts the hose around Brian's throat um, and Brian starts to masturbate. Okay. While he's choking him. So guess what Tony does next? Does he try to snap his neck? Does he hurt him or run away or call the police? 
No. He lets Brian tie the hose around his own neck. Tony. Tony. I thought... I Tony! Thought we had, I thought we had an understanding. Tony, look at the mannequins. They're all... If I... Okay. I don't even know how to put this in a... Basically, if I knew someone... If something in me told me, oh, they killed your friend, I wouldn't then be like, oh, choke me. Well, yeah, but you're not Tony. Apparently not. Apparently I'm smarter. So Tony did not heed the wisdom of the mannequins and was like, okay, sure. But this is what he did. All right. He let Brian choke him. But when it became too intense, he pretended to be unconscious, which I feel like is probably pretty hard if you're, like, being choked to death. Yeah, like, you're already literally going unconscious. Yeah. Not voluntarily. And you're... you're so to also act yeah, and, it, and get the same effect is you, pretty impressive. You'd think your, like, intuition would be to, like, fight back. So, like, to make your body pretend to be unconscious yeah. seems, like, pretty difficult. But that's what he did. Um, so when he pretended to be unconscious, Brian got off of him and started to whisper his name. <sighs> then he started to shake him violently. And then Tony <laughs> opened his eyes and grinned at him. And Brian freaked the fuck out and started yelling about how much Brian had scared him and said, you know, you can die doing this. There have been accidents. And then Tony has the fucking balls to say, is that what happened to Roger Goodlett? Oh, was, Tony is a bold, bold man. Was he one of your accidents? Oh, shit. It's like a fucking movie. Like, what? Well, yeah. Stop. Mm -hmm. Very, very dramatic. Was he one of your accidents? Okay. <laughs> Reaching. I feel like one of his mother. I feel like his mother. I'm like, Tony, this isn't <laughs> some sort of movie. Uh, 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 come over here. Tony. Get away from that. Shut your mouth. What did I tell you? Brian apparently just stares at him and doesn't answer, but just grins at him. <gasps> the worst. Yes. Still high on whatever drugs he's taken. So Tony basically just waits until Brian's asleep, then starts scouting out the rest of the house to see what's up. Oh, so wait. Oh, he doesn't leave. He just, like, wanders around the house. He literally scathed death. Yeah. All right. What the fuck ever Tony wants to do, I guess, is what Tony's going to do. Tony is just, like, strong-headed. Let's leave it there. Like, let's talk about Die Hard, but, like, the Tony version. Right. <laughs> like, Tony just won't succumb to this. It's like Tony get Okay, what happened? This tomfoolery. So, Tony's walking around, and he's like, oh, here are children's toys and women's clothing. Clearly, Brian has been lying. He's not the landscaper of this mm -hmm. empty house, like... Someone lives here, and it's him. Then he goes, oh, Brian Smart is probably not his real name. Why don't I go find out his real name? Mm -hmm. So he goes all the way back down to the basement pool and finds Brian's fucking pants that are on the ground. Yeah, and gets his wallet. Gets his wallet. But while he's shaking the wallet out, Brian wakes up. Jesus Christ, Tony. It's like a fucking movie, right? So somehow... Um, Brian wakes up and Tony's like, oh, hi, good morning, whatever. Somehow Tony convinces Brian to drive him back into town unscathed. Uh, Brian congratulates Tony and says, you really know how to play. Yeah. Yuck. And then drops him off. So let's get back to our friend Vandegriff, the PI. Vandegriff hears the story. He goes to Detective Mary Wilson, who had been investigating miss missing persons cases around this time. I think I mm -hmm. mentioned her. She was like an Indianapolis uh, police detective. Super sleuth. Super sleuth. Um, so Mary takes Tony on a prowl throughout the suburbs. Uh, they stopped at different estates to see if anything seemed familiar. She also had several men stop um, troll gay bars around town to talk to like patrons and owners to see if anyone knew who this guy might be. Um, at this point, Vandegrift's secretary, Connie Pierce, mm -hmm. a.k.a. M and Christine, mm -hmm. decides to call a friend of hers, a psychic named Wanda, which, like, also, did they do that on purpose? Like, a fish named Wanda? Oh. Like, a psychic named Wanda. Yeah, maybe. Whatever. So, Connie calls a psychic named Wanda. Mm-hmm. 
um, and plays Wanda the tapes of the interviews with Tony. Here's what Wanda said. I see a man tied to a bed, handcuffed, spread-eagled. I see pictures being taken while he is being strangled. The tongue is swollen, quite long, coming out of his mouth, and the eyes. Oh, that's a hell house. Tell Tony never to go there again. Oh. Dun, dun, dun. Wanda fucking knows. Fucking, well, fish named Wanda knows also, all. Also, you realize why they called her Wanda, right? No. Because of Fairly Odd Parent? Yeah. Wait, because why they called this psychic Wanda? Oh, no. I think I meant why they called the fish slash fairy godparent in the fairly odd parents why they called her wanda i did not know that until this very second what are you talking about i don't know what are you talking about why did they call the fairly odd parent wanda it it's literally just hitting me right now the fish named wanda Uh uh-huh right why did they call her wanda because i go like I don't, I don't know. What's the answer? I don't know. Because, like, she has a wand. Oh, yeah. That's it. But it's not, like, based on a fish named Wanda? Because aren't they fish? Oh, I see what's happening. That's why I'm confused now. I feel like there's multiple layers to this. I feel like you knew what I meant and I knew what you meant, yeah, yeah, but yeah. we both thought there was another thing that we were both missing. Yes. All right. Let's just erase all that. We complete each other. Oh. Uh-huh. A fish named... It, but... I was going to say that. I was going to say, oh, a wand. But then I was like, maybe it's something deeper. (sighs) Okay. Hi, Nickelodeon. (laughs) You should work for them someday. So, you think, though? I think you'd be good at it. But obviously not, because I don't really get how their shows work. I guess not. No. Well, seriously, I mean, there's no show about Geo yet, so. Yeah, there's not yet. Yet. He could be the new Blue's Clues. Oh, my God. He could be the new face. Oh, he could be the new face. Oh, my God. Remember (laughs) Face loved peanut butter and banana sandwiches. So did I. Me too. I learned it from Face. Me too. Stop it. Okay, let's just keep going. Oh, God, this is beautiful. So, anyway, Wanda's like, listen, Tony, don't go there anymore. And the search continued. So, at this point, let's go back to, remember Herb? Oh, who could forget? Herb's marriage is unraveling Mm, steady decline just down 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 his wife's he his and his wife's company the save a lot Mm -hmm. thrift store is going down the drain so are their finances um it's been about a year at this point after the search for brian smart has begun tony our friend tony Mm -hmm. is at a bar called the varsity lounge uh, when who does he see walk in the front door, but Brian Smart himself. Oh my. He, being fucking Tony, mm-hmm. so nonchalant, doesn't act, you know, surprised or whatever, just has a conversation with him, spends the whole night talking to him. Then when Brian leaves, he writes down his license plate number and immediately calls the police. That's a smart Tony. Tony is a badass. That's a smart Tony. This whole time we thought he was an idiot. No, he's been like luring this dude along, you know? (sighs) Yeah. Um, And surprise, surprise, the license plate did not belong to a Brian Smart, but to a Herbert R. Baumeister. This is slowly moving from any old movie to like a lifetime movie. It's a thousand percent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But a more progressive where it's like gay men instead of just like mm-hmm. heterosexual people. I see yeah. what's happening. Um, the detective, Mary Wilson, if you remember, confronted Herb at his store, but he refused to let her search his property. And then so she went to Julie, his wife, who was equally as stubborn, but Mary gave Julie her card and said it was basically like one of those law and order moments where they were like, if you change your mind, give us a call. Mm -hmm. And then left with like putting doubts in her mind, you know? Nice. So lo and behold, six months later, Herb was out of town and uh, Julie, his wife, had her lawyer call Mary Wilson, the detective. She told Mary about the time her son found those bones in the backyard. Mm. The fucking skeleton that yep. was, you know. Not a Halloween costume. What do you call it? Or... Dissection skeleton. Yeah. yeah. Not a Halloween decoration. No. No, 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 no. So Mary Wilson took the police 
to their house and she took these two guys who were like who literally called it bullshit and said they're this is like you're wasting our time basically Mm -hmm. um the yard at first glance looked normal but when the men began to kick through low grass and patches of dirt um they found a bone about a foot long charred from having been burned Mm. Um, they weren't sure at first if it was human, and then they kind of started to look at the area around them and realized that the pebbles and rocks that were around them were actually fragments of bone. Oh, no. They weren't actually rocks. They were just pieces of bone. Gross. So, uh, the lawyer, Bill Wendling, was watching the police scoop up, um, one chipped bone after another and he looked down at his own feet and he said it's so obvious it's unclear like they were just standing among like pieces of bone basically oh wow um he realized that he was also standing in what resembled bone chips and it was in the middle of the backyard where the baumeister kids would play every day um at one point he even picked up a something off the ground and it was a a human tooth oh my there were basically pieces of bone everywhere so mary delivered these bags of evidence to a forensic anthropologist named stephen naraki at the university of indiana and his answer immediately came back as quote they're human they're recent and they've been burned Mm. the next day the police returned to the scene um And it was one of the worst crimes Indiana has ever encountered. Uh, It basically turned out that Herb Baumeister's homemade graveyard contained the remains of many young homosexuals who over the years had vanished from the streets of Indianapolis. Oh, it was just a gay graveyard? Yeah. Fuck. Um, So they started getting more and more officials to join the search party and to join the kind of dig on the premises. Uh, The dig continued until the late hours. Other policemen uh, came in and checked out the inside of the home, and they found the mannequins, the wet bar, the pool, everything that Tony had described. Um, But they did find something that Tony had not seen on the evening of his encounter, which was a video camera (gasps) that had been used to tape all the strangulations. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. So the number of people digging had swelled to about 60 volunteers, which were mostly off-duty policemen and firemen. Um, After a couple days, they found 5,500 bones, teeth, and bone fragments. Oh, my God. And they were able to uh, make up about four bodies. Shit. To identify just off those first couple days. Then neighbors from a farm uh, across the way came to inform police that they had found evidence of more bones. They led investigators to an area. It was like a drainage ditch, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, And there were human ribs, vertebrae, and spines. Shit. Apparently, one official murmured, Jesus Christ, they're everywhere. (sighs) There were so many bones um, that they actually stuck up from the mud so you could see them oh god like they're jagged yeah like coming out of the dirt oh no so shovels you know dug up the bones but also cans of miller genuine draft beer which was herb's favorite drink uh as well as handcuffs that were presumed to be on the victims when they had died And by the time the dig had actually ended, they had determined that uh, probably 11 men had been buried among this backyard. Fuck. Could they identify most of them? They were able to positively identify only four of the victims. Uh, That sucks. I know. So it was Roger Allen Goodlett, Stephen Hale, Richard Hamilton, and Manuel Resendez. To this day, the remains of the others... Uh, wait to be identified. Shit. Yeah. Very sad. Um, so where was Herb at this point? So he had, he was visiting his mom when, uh, his wife had called the police and said, you can come check out my place. Mm -hmm. Um, when he kind of got a hint that something was going on, uh, he pieced the fuck out. He basically faded away. 
The only clue the police had came from Brad Baumeister, who was uh, Herb's brother. And he called and said that um, his older brother had called him from a town in Michigan and said he was on a business trip and needed money very quickly. Mm. Uh, after Brad sent him the money, he had heard about what was going on at his home and immediately called the authorities. Mm. Good job, Brad. Good job, Brad. Good boy. Yep. Good boy. Um, basically what they can determine now is that Herb had headed north and entered Canada. He basically spent several days there, then drove east along the Lake Huron shoreline to Grand Bend, Ontario. And there on the evening of July 3rd, he took his 357 Magnum revolver barrel to his forehead and pulled the trigger. Yikes. He took his own life, and the note he left behind uh, said that he blamed his failing business and an irreparable marriage, but there was no mention of the bodies that he had left behind in Westfield. Instead, his final words on the three-page suicide note explained that he would now eat a peanut butter sandwich, his favorite snack, and then go to sleep. Wow. The evening before he died, a Canadian trooper had stopped him because he was sleeping in his car under a bridge. And he explained uh, that he was merely a tourist passing through. She noted at the time some luggage in his car and what looked like a pile of videotapes. Oh, crap. In his backseat. The videotapes, uh, Virgil Vandegriff believes they might be the videotapes of the, the, strangulations. the strangulations that he had committed. But uh, when they found his body after he had killed himself, there was no sign of the tapes on him. Vandegriff basically said he must have tossed them in a lake before he shot himself and then added, perhaps it's for the best. Perhaps. Interestingly enough, Baumeister's photo actually matches the police sketches drawn from witnesses who thought they'd seen the I-70 Strangler mm. because he had a lot of business trips to Ohio um, and one eyewitness actually came forward to identify Herb's picture as that of the same man who had driven his friend home from a bar one evening in 1988. And his friend had actually been found dead the next morning. So not long after, uh, representatives from Ohio and Indiana held a press conference to link Baumeister with the I-70 slangs. And... People aren't sure whether he's actually the same guy who had committed the stranglings, the I-70 stranglings or not, but um, everything does seem to point to him, especially because the roadside killings on I-70 ended the same time he bought his house and now had a place to bury bodies and hide. Oh, shit. Hide the bones. That's like a prequel slash one and a half again. Exactly. So, all in all, he was linked to about 18, but assumed to be more victims. Wow. That's the story of Herb. Hmm. That's wild. Right? Yeah. Nuts. Nutso. So, ta-da. I need a drink. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Um, is that all you got? That's all I got. We got our, our uh... Uh, thing today we got a thing yeah what thing our um facebook live oh is that today sunday right yeah today at three hey we will be here for your whatever questions you have and i finally have an ipad tripod holder so we're not gonna be just like fucking around with the noise again perfect can't I wait i promise i promise Anyway, we love you guys. Thank you for listening. Thank you. We love you guys. And that's why we drink. And that's why we drink. Here, clink it. That's M's middle finger on my wine glass. That's probably the best description of our podcast. <laughs> Your middle finger on my wine glass. And that's why we drink. And that's why we drink. Bye.